It's a privilege this morning to be able to worship a real God. A God who cares for us and a God who is passionate about us. A God who has and who, pre, who initiated his interest in our lives. It's wonderful to know this morning that we can, we can worship God and we can exalt God and we can glorify God. But everything that we do is purely a response towards God. It is a response towards that which He has already given to us. This morning I want to speak to you about uh, righteousness and I would like to answer a couple of questions about grace. We are on a journey where we are continuously speaking about the gospel of Jesus Christ. Not a doctrine, not a part of the gospel, but the gospel of Jesus Christ. And in, in our discussions around righteousness and, and grace, we are trying to discover and we are trying to live God's agenda and God's purpose for our lives. And I truly believe that we cannot separate grace and the gospel of Jesus Christ with the agenda and God's purpose for our lives. Because we find purpose and we find God's agenda only in understanding our relationship and understanding our position in Jesus Christ as sons and daughters. The Bible says that we are no longer slaves, but we have received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. We have been moved from slavery into sonship. And it is in sonship that we find and where we realize and where we come to the understanding and we gain the knowledge of what is God's purpose and what is God's plan for my life. When we speak of the Christian life and we speak about living the way Christians should live and doing what Christians should do, many of us have a feeling in our hearts and we get clamped by the feeling of inadequacy, the feeling of failure and even the feeling of frustration. Many of us experience that this Christian life that we are supposed to be living and the Christian life and then the way in which we are to conduct our lives is hard work. And it's difficult for some of us to every single day wake up and go to bed in the evening feeling like I have been a successful Christian. And I think the question that comes to mind and that came to my mind is, is it supposed to be hard work to be a Christian? Is it supposed to be hard work to be involved in a personal relationship with Jesus? Because when we speak of Christianity, we speak of being in relationship with Jesus. And I, I, I fervently do not believe that it is supposed to be hard work to be a Christian or to be in intimate relationship with Jesus. I think hard work and the opinion of Christianity being hard work is purely a result of our own opinions, our own viewpoints, our own personal convictions and our own designed theologies. Theologies that we have created, ways of thinking that we have created, designed religions, I think is what robs us of the freedom of being able to live in the liberty of personal and intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. When we speak of hard work, we let's start at the beginning. Why, did, why would we label Christianity as hard work? When we hear the gospel for the first time, we hear that there is nothing that we can do in ourselves to get saved. We hear that we cannot save ourselves. We hear that we are in need of a Savior, and that Savior is Jesus Christ. We hear and we read, as Romans 5 verse 6 says, that it is while we were still sinners that Jesus Christ decided to lay down his life for us and to die so that we may be saved. This is the gospel that we hear and it is the truth. It is God who decided independently from our influence or our input to pour out his love on us and save us from wrath and from condemnation. We feel and we experience that we are saved by grace. We hear the good news that Jesus did everything and we receive him as our personal savior. And we are happy and we are on our way to heaven. Amen. But from salvation till the day we meet up in heaven, 
There is a life to live. And it seems that it is in this period of the life to live that we experience Christianity as hard work. Because it is here and now where we hear of all the activities that we need to perform in order to stay qualified as Christians. It is here where we hear of all the activities that we need to do so that we can keep God's favor upon our lives. Firstly, we heard that we could do nothing and it was all God's work and God reached out towards us and God saved us by grace. And now we hear that we have got certain criteria uh, according to which we should live, certain ways of conduct, certain behavior, certain things we need to do. And when we do all these things, we stay qualified to be called Christians, our daily life and our activities of prayer, of going to church, of reading our Bible, of standing in relationship, it all becomes works and activities to be able to keep our Christian status. Remember we are speaking about hard work. Paul had a similar situation and a similar problem with the church of Galatians. I want you to read with me in the message, Galatians 3 verse 1, where Paul addressed this problem where the Galatians experienced the freedom of and the free gift of salvation, but felt that they needed to complete their salvation by the upholding of the law. Galatians 3 verse 1 in the message says, You crazy Galatians! Did someone put a hex on you? Have you taken leave of your senses? Something crazy has happened, for it is obvious that you no longer have the crucified Jesus in clear focus in your lives. His sacrifice on the cross was certainly set before you clearly enough. Let me put this question to you. How did your new life begin? Was it by working your heads off to please God? Or was it by responding to God's message to you? Are you going to continue in this craziness? For only crazy people would think they could complete their own efforts what was begun by God. If you weren't smart enough and strong enough to begin it, how do you suppose you should perfect it? The Galatians, like I've mentioned, heard the gospel of Jesus as a free gift, but felt that they needed to complete their salvation by the upholding of the law. And people... If we look at our own lives and if we look at the way that our minds have been conditioned and the way that we think, is it not something that we also practice in our daily lives today? Do we not in some cases and in some situations evaluate the quality and the standard of our relationship and our acceptance before God based on how well we get it right to do all the right things and to say all the right things and how well we get it right to be the good Christians that we are supposed to be? That is why some days we feel that we are totally and completely accepted before God. Because we feel like we have qualified by doing enough good things. The next day we feel we are not qualified or we are not worthy of being children of God. Because we have failed, we have made mistakes and we have let God down. One day it feels like we're praying straight into the throne room of God and we know that God will answer our prayers because we are confident of our relationship with God. The next day or the next week we pray and deep in our hearts we are worried about the fact, will God really answer me because have I done enough to qualify for an answer? Is it not that exact? work that the Galatians did that we are practicing in our lives today and this brings about to us an experience of hard work people there is nothing and I want you to listen to me very clearly there is nothing that you did to impress God good enough uh, uh, that to impress God enough so that he could save you and there is nothing that you can do today to convince God to keep loving you 
You had no input. You had no uh, uh, contribution to God's original decision to love you madly. You do not have anything now to do any further. There is no work that you can perform. There is no act that you can do that would cause God to love you more or to keep on loving you. God decided to love you eternally because He created you to love you, to be in personal and intimate relationship with you. Not because of what you have done. Ephesians 1 verse 4 says the following. Even as in his love he chose us, actually picked us out for himself as his own in Christ before the foundation of the world so that we should be wholly consecrated and set apart for him and blameless in his sight even above reproach before him in love. People, God does not love you because you are a faithful and devoted Christian in the eyes of people. God loves you because he has chosen you before the foundation of the world to see you blameless, pure, and holy, acceptable before him. That is why God loves us. So we cannot, we cannot start off in faith. And believe that we receive Christ as a free gift. And then feel that we need to earn and to work in order to keep our Christian status. And to keep God's love for us. He loves you irrespective. Irrespective of who you are. God has chosen to love you. And he has chosen to love us. He has chosen to give us salvation. He has chosen to give us righteousness. He has chosen to give us justification as a free gift. We receive this by faith. And what makes us tired, people, is working to qualify for these gifts. This is hard work. It's hard work to work for something that you already have received. Because you will continuously and always feel that you are not good enough to earn it if you do not realize that you already have received salvation. You already have received justification. You already have been made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Does this mean that the law has been abolished? Does it mean that we are now lawless? Does it mean that we can live and do exactly the way we want? The law has not been abolished. The law has been fulfilled. Because there's a lot of fear in the hearts of people today concerning upholding the law, living according to the law. Jesus came and he said the following in Matthew 5:17. Do not think that I have come to destroy the law or the prophets. I have not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Jesus came to fulfill the law because we have no ability in ourselves to be able to fulfill the law. There is nobody here today who can boast in upholding the whole law. And if we are guilty of one of the laws, we are guilty of the whole law. So nobody can say, I have arrived and in my own ability I have upheld the law. If we were able to uphold the law, Jesus would not have to come as the perfect sacrifice to die and to fulfill the law and to live the perfect life so that we could be made complete in him. So the law is not abolished. The law is fulfilled by the life of Christ and the way that Jesus Christ lived. So what is the reason and what is the purpose of the law today? Galatians 3.24 says, So that the law has become a trainer of us until Christ, that we might be justified by faith. The law is a trainer. There's another translation that says the law is a schoolmaster unto Christ. Because the more we try and uphold the law and the more we try and gain favor and acceptance from God based on our efforts, the more we realize that we are inadequate in our own abilities to uphold the law. The more we realize that we fail, the harder we try, the more we fail. The harder our efforts are, the more we let ourselves down. The more we feel we lose. I am now accepted, I am now qualified, I am now justified, I have now been made righteous by the finished work of Jesus and the law points me to Jesus. So living under grace and living under the righteousness of God is not a lawless life. The law points us to Jesus as the perfect sacrifice. 
The perfect life and this perfect sacrifice of God, people, has freed us from trying to gain access to God. Listen to me very carefully. This is very important. The perfect life and the perfect sacrifice of Jesus has freed us from trying to gain access to God. Many Christians are tired because they are continuously trying to get to God. They are continuously trying to gain access to God, to gain acceptance from God, to gain in, and to, to be able to enter into God's presence. People, the finished work of the cross and Jesus who has fulfilled the law has placed us in a situation and in a place where we are living and moving and having our being in an intimate place personal love relationship with God we are no longer trying to get to God we have been given access and position in God this should free us from hard work this should free us from feeling that we are never making it this should bring us to the understanding that when I pray, I'm not praying to a God on the other side of the ceiling. I'm praying to a living king who is living with inside of me. Who has placed me in intimate personal relationship with him. The problem is many of us are driven by fear when we hear the true gospel of Jesus. This which I am preaching is the true gospel of Jesus. And many of us feel that if we do not have a law, to govern our lives. We do not trust ourselves and we feel that we might be free to go and sin and to do what we want and to live the way we want. Isn't it true that even though we are governed by the law and try and live by the law, we sin anyway? So the law is not keeping us from sin. But yet we are afraid that if we remove the law, we're going to sin. That doesn't make sense. We must understand people. Romans 6 verse 1 says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin so that grace may abound? Let it not be. How shall we who die to sin live any longer in it? Living in grace and righteousness, people, is not freedom to sin. It is not freedom to give expression and to, to release expression of the flesh and the desires of the flesh. Living in grace and righteousness is the exact opposite. Grace and righteousness have placed me in an intimate love relationship with God. The law and my ability to try and impress God and gain access to God had me in a mechanical relationship with God. I was worshipping a lot of things that I knew about God. But righteousness has brought me into an intimate love. I want you to understand that this is not just any type of relationship. This is not a business relationship. This is a love relationship. This is an intimate relationship where I am involved in God and God is involved in me. And I can dance with God and I can walk with God in the summer breeze like Adam and Eve. And I can have communion with God and I can have intimacy and fellowship with Him. That is what grace and righteousness has gifted me. And if I'm not serving God in grace and righteousness, I'm busy with a mechanical relationship. And we're speaking about the fact, remember, does grace and righteousness give me the freedom to sin? Matthew 22 verse 36 says the following, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. So the law is fulfilled in this, that we should love God and respond to the love that He has originally and already given to us. When we live in love relationship with God, there is a new law that governs our lives. There is a new law that governs our behavior. There is a new law that governs our decisions. And it's not a law that is written in stone. It's a law of love that is written on the tables of my heart, that is born in intimate and personal relationship with a living savior and a living king who is part of my existence if we if we use a, a practical example of 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 our marriage we can see that the law of love motivates me not to want to sin because 
in a love relationship in marriage, husband and wife love each other. And if I had to ask you gentlemen today and you ladies today, why is it that you do not choose to be unfaithful to your husband or to your wife? The right answer is, I do not want to be unfaithful to my wife because I love her. I do not want to be unfaithful to my husband because I care for him. I care about him. I love him. I do not want to disappoint him. I am involved in his life and he is involved in my life. If I had to ask the question, why do you not be, or why are you, are, are you faithful to your wife? And your answer is, I do it because the law says it. I feel sorry for you. Because then you have a mechanical relationship with your wife. But you do not have a mechanical relationship. You have a love relationship. And because of that love for each other, you choose not to love somebody else. And this is exactly how the law of love works. The law that I have, of the, the law of love in my heart that I, that I have with God is the law that governs my behavior. It's the law that teaches me. It's the law of love that, that shows me and gives me direction. It's not a law that causes me to fear and to run from God. It's a law that causes me to run towards God. When I have made a mistake, I do not run from God. I run towards God. When I, uh, when I, have, when I have let myself down, I do not run away from God and feel under, uh, I'm condemned and that I'm rejected by God. I run towards God because His everlasting love is enough to put His arms around me and He's let me know that I'm deeply loved, highly favored and richly blessed and that His love within me would change my heart in such a way that I do not desire to do what I have done again. It changes my heart in such a way that I do not have interest in the sin I used to do. I do not have the, the, the joy that I used to get from what I used to do. It has changed my heart. Something has changed me from the inside. You see, God is not into behavioral manipulation. He's into heart transformation. And heart transformation comes from intimate, personal love relationship. From within. If the law of love has replaced the law written on stone. Another reason why we are afraid of the true gospel of Jesus. Is that we do not realize that the law has been replaced. Like I've mentioned just now. When the absence of the law is there. We feel vulnerable. We feel threatened. We feel exposed. Because we do not know what the right thing is to do. And I think it is here. Here. When we experience what I've just spoken of, when we fear and we feel vulnerable because there's nothing to govern our lives, I think it exposes the type of relationship that we're involved in when we speak of a Christian life. You see, because many of us have a lot of knowledge about God. We have a lot of knowledge about what the right thing is to do and what the wrong thing is to do. And we have knowledge about how to do the right thing and how to do the wrong thing. We have knowledge about how to conduct ourselves to be able to be labeled as a good and devoted Christian. We have a lot of knowledge about our religion and about our, our charismatic beliefs. We have a lot of knowledge about God. But we can so easily become involved in idolatry. Worshipping the knowledge we have of God and missing God in relationship completely. We need to understand that coming to a place where we feel fearful when the law is absent, we must ask ourselves, have we been serving knowledge of God or have we been busy with intimate personal relationship with God? As long as I see myself and the knowledge of God as the source of my life, I will always try to be a good Christian. I'll always be trying harder to make it. I'll always be trying harder to qualify. But it's not about knowledge of God. It's about knowing God. The replacement of the law is knowing. It's not about knowledge. It's about knowing God. Speaking of this replacement that has taken place, we read in Romans 6 verse 10, the following. For by the death he died, he died to sin, ending his relation to it once for all. And the life, listen to this, the life that he lives, he is living to God in unbroken fellowship with him. Not the life that he has lived or is going to live. The Bible says the life that he is now living. He is living to God. 
people understanding and coming to the full knowledge of grace is understanding that Jesus is not only interested in forgiving your sins. That is part of the gospel. Jesus is not only interested in forgiving your sins, Jesus wants to live his life through you. Jesus wants to be the essence of your existence. He wants to be the the center and the core of your being. Jesus wants to be your life. It's not just about getting you saved. It's not just about getting you forgiven. That's a part of the gospel. It's about the life of Christ, the replacement of the law that comes and lives within me and I live in God and I've become inseparably joined one with Him. And this is the new law that governs my life. It's the life of Christ being lived through me to God that brings glory to God. The life of Christ in us and through us is the only one that can produce a pleasing and acceptable and a holy life before God. Only the life of Christ is acceptable before God. In our abilities, we will never qualify. In our abilities, we will always fall short. In our abilities, we will always have a lack of what we need to be able to qualify before God. But thank God, we do not qualify through our works. We qualify through the life of Christ that is acceptable and well-pleasing before Him. Jesus said the following in John 3, uh, 4 verse 34. Jesus said to them, My food, my nourishment is to do the will, the pleasure of him who sent me to accomplish and completely finish his work. As Christ is living this life through me, there is something that gives Christ nourishment and life within me. And that is to do and to complete the work of God. What is the work that God is finishing and what Christ is finishing and what he is speaking of in John 4 verse 34? Philippians 1 verse 6 says the following, Being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Christ. Christ. The good work of salvation that was given to you as a free gift is being completed by Jesus' nourishment who is doing the will of the Father who is living his life unto God who is producing a well-pleasing and acceptable life before God. He is completing your salvation. The completion of your salvation is not in your ability but in the ability of the life of Christ being lived through you. Even in times of difficulty. Because this message does not mean that this life is about moonlight and roses. This message does not mean everything just goes the way I want it to go. When I'm in peak traffic, everybody just pulls over, flickers all over, people on the pavements, yeah, you come through. That's not what it's about. It's about knowing that when I am faced with tribulation, I'm not going to get out of this tribulation because I'm highly talented. Or because I can work hard and gain favor from God so that he might do something for me. God wants to do something for you. He can't wait for you to get out of the way and acknowledge the life of Christ within you. To guide you through difficult times. To be your strength when you are weak. To be able to give you courage when you do feel you do not have courage. When you feel like laying down and not walking another step. He wants to be the life. He wants to be the energy. He wants to be the power. He wants to be your wisdom. He wants to be that which you need to be able to face confrontations. To go through fire. The Bible says in in Isaiah 44, you will go through fire but it will not burn you. In other words, we will go through fire, but in the fire when we realize that it is about the life of Christ, it's about Jesus living his life through us towards God as a well-pleasing and acceptable sacrifice. We can go through this fire and know that the courage I need, the protection I need, the strength I need is all found not in the knowledge of God, but looking inside of me to the life of God that is there to give me what I need. When I go through the waters, the Bible says, it will not overflow you. It will not overcome you. Because in this life, people, let's be, be fair, let's be real. Everything is not perfect. Things don't work out always the way we want them to work out. But it does not make the Christian life hard work. Understanding what I'm speaking of this morning, people, is is a process. 
It's a renewal of your mind. And I pray, God, that this is not just something you hear and forget about it tonight. Take the DVD and go and listen to this message and make grace and righteousness and make the peace of God and the life of God part of your existence. Live in it, move in it, have your being in it so that you can live the freedom that God has given to you. You have not been created to live here on earth in slavery until one day when you get to heaven to be a free man. The day you receive Jesus Christ, eternal life began in you and you are now free to roam in wide open spaces and allow the love of God to govern you and to guide you and to steer you according to his perfect will let's pray together father thank you for Jesus Jesus thank you that you have come thank you that you have liberated us thank you that you have set us free thank you that you have given us the understanding that we are free from judgment, that we are free from the wrath of God, that we are free from the anger of God. I pray today, Lord, that the gospel of Jesus would become part of our lives. Lord, that we would not just see and experience that which we've heard this morning as a part of a religion or part of our knowledge about God, but Lord, let us live Let us understand, let us experience submission unto the life of Christ within us. Let us experience how grace and how love and how righteousness leads us on the paths of righteousness. Let us experience, Lord, how sin and the desires to sin dies off within us as you transform our hearts in accordance to our relationship with you. Bring us freedom, Lord. Freedom from labor. Freedom from, freedom from hard work. Freedom from trying to get access to God, but living and moving and having our being within God. We praise you for that in the beautiful name of Jesus. Lord, I pray for every person in this place this morning. We have circumstances and situations that are beyond their ability. Who are going through fire, who are going through deep waters. Who are facing situations that are out of their control. Lord, We cast our cares on you right now. And we pray that you would make doors and open doors where there are no doors. I pray that your word be a light unto our feet and a lamp unto our path. I pray that we would experience, as Isaiah 52, 12 says, that you have gone before us, that you have set our path clear, that you are our rearward, that we will sing as the psalmist and said that surely goodness and mercies will follow us all the days of our lives. Lord, that we would just revel in your presence, revel in your love and experience your goodness in the midst of circumstance. Thank you for changing circumstance. Lord, exalt yourself as the great I am. Exalt yourself as the answer, the truth, the way, and the life. And bring about change. We declare change in people's lives this morning. We declare, Lord, healing in people's bodies. We declare restoration of relationships in the name of Jesus. And we thank you for that, Father. We love you. We adore you. And we thank you for being to us who you are. In Jesus' name. Amen.